Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is John Cameron. I'll be your moderator for the show this evening. I'm going to let my guests introduce themselves and, and give a little background. Uh, well, introduce themselves first, and then we're going to give a little background about uh, why we're libertarians and how we got there. Uh, my name is again John Cameron. I work for Pacific Legal Foundation as a development officer, and, if, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Brett for a short introduction. I'm Brett Owens, co-founder at a software company called Lead Dino. We make marketing uh, products, automation for small businesses, and also uh, chief editor at Contrarian Outlook, where we focus on dividend producing investments as well. Okay. And Gerald? I'm Gerald Clift. I'm an attorney, computer programmer, and liberty activist. Cool. And then uh, I think it's uh, um, our, our viewers might like to know you know, how we came to be libertarians, not the dictionary or encyclopedia version that takes about an hour, but the short Cliff Notes version. Um, I read Ayn Rand uh, when I, th I think it was 15. I was hanging out with some other objectivists, and it seemed to me that, um, that uh, libertarian philosophy really mirrored nature, that, uh, you know, the, the, the strongest uh, leader of the herd, the one that could, could find water and, and good pasture, was the leader. And, and if you couldn't do that, you weren't the leader. And uh, people who were animals who fought the hardest and, and were the strongest survived, and the weak perished. Not that I'm suggesting that people should die off if they're, they're weak, but it seemed to me that, that the whole libertarian objectivist philosophy really mirrored uh, what I would call the laws of nature. And now it seems to me that those laws of nature have been kind of perverted and distorted and, and used to impose socialism on the country. So that's, that's one of the ways I got here. Sure, so last week we talked about our affinity for both of the major parties. And as I got disenchanted with uh, each one, but thinking about things that I liked, I realized I was a uh, fiscal conservative and a social liberal. So basically a classic liberal, a, a libertarian where... Classic liberal. Classic yeah. liberal, just wanted to uh, do my own thing, mostly be left alone and let other people do their own thing. As long as they don't hurt anyone else, uh, they just go on their merry way. And uh, I agree with uh, your observations that as you see this in, in practice, it tends to be the most effective way for humans to interact. Uh, as you said last week, we're mostly pretty nice to each other. We usually work things out when we're left to our, our own mm -hmm. devices. Mm -hmm. And Brett? Um, I uh, just was a very attracted to the libertarian philosophy of social tolerance and uh, fiscal responsibility and uh, became very disillusioned with how our federal government was working during my uh, high school and college years under the Bush administration. And then... Um, this guy, uh, Ron Paul, came along, congressman from Texas. Ron just, Paul, uh, Ron Paul, you know, Ron he just Paul. did amazing in the debates. Uh, I really, really felt that he was uh, speaking to me and just seemed to have the right ideas about the role of government and the size and scope that it should take. Mm -hmm. And I felt the need to get more involved and with his campaign, but also just uh, generally with um, supporting uh, causes of liberty. Cool. Okay. Well, on that note, viewers, we'll, we'll start with our topics. The first one, um, I think, Gerald, you want to talk about occupational licensing regarding dentists is hurting poor people. Yeah, so there was actually a really good article in uh, Reason Magazine recently about the um, harm that the American Dental Association is doing by uh, fighting um, dental assistants, uh, dental therapists. It's, it's a new type of classification they're creating similar to... Um, uh, nurse practitioners. So or you know, physician's assistant. Ex or, right. Exactly. Yeah. So you're n it's not quite to the level of a dentist, but you're able to serve communities that wouldn't otherwise be served. So right now, a lot of uh, dentists concentrate in the suburbs where you know uh, more wealthy people might be, and frankly, more people exist to be customers, which leaves rural areas without adequate dental care. So uh, Alaska, over the last 10 years, actually started allowing these um, this, this new class of uh, dental therapists to work with uh, Native Americans, and they found that they were able to provide uh, dental cleanings, fluoride treatment, and uh, other dental care at a reduced cost and provided to people that otherwise wouldn't be able to make it to mm -hmm. a, a dentist. And sure enough, people got better dental care and dental problems severely dropped in the area. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Interestingly, the Federal Trade Commission is very much in favor of this. They see it as a cost reduction measure and a way to increase access. But as I mentioned earlier, the American Dental Association is like, no, 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 we, we have all these licensing laws in place. We don't want you hurting the bottom line for our dentists. Mm -hmm. So, But if the interest is truly in providing affordable, quality dental care to as many people as possible, we need to allow more people to practice without being hindered by these licensing laws. So, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna did you wanna comment on this before I threw in my 35 cents? Yeah. It's, I, I would say it's amazing that you can, you can find great anything except for dentists, doctors, which are regulated and have their supply mm -hmm. uh, constricted. If you want a great restaurant, you pull up your phone, you go to Yelp, you find a great restaurant, it's rated highly, you go to it, and, and there you go. Uh, if you're looking for a gardener to help with your house, you can go through the same process. You find somebody highly rated, highly touted, uh, and usually you have a very good experience. We just got a hot water heater, that's what we did. Um, good luck trying to do uh, get a doctor or a dentist that way. You have to go through a referral, uh, you hope that they're taking new patients. Uh, you're probably going to wait many months before you can get your first appointment in. Uh, it just shows the difference in terms of having a restricted market versus a, a wide open market where it's left to sort itself out. Well, let, let me pose this question. Um, all of these regulations, especially when it comes to the medical field, are, are, are put in place with the idea that they're protecting people from the dangers of unlicensed practitioners when your health is at stake. Um, I'm going to throw out this idea that actually it's a, it's a monopoly designed to prevent competition. And I propose a little change. You have the AMA. Let's go ahead and start a competing organization called the AHA, the American Healers Association. You can both put out a shingle, and then the way you find out if, if you want to go to an AMA doctor or an AHA medicine man is by going to Yelp and finding out how satisfied their patients are. And then you can choose to go wherever you want, like you can for the restaurant. What do you think? Oh, I think that if that idea? happens, everyone's gonna go to AHA because they're gonna have all the Yelp reviews. Because ah. <laughs> if you, good luck looking up doctor reviews on Yelp, they're few and far between, yeah. and they are often not even representative. So uh, if, if AHA is more open, assuming that they're more mm -hmm. open than the mm -hmm. AMA is currently, then I think it, it wouldn't take too long. So again, for, and would this play into the idea, the libertarian idea that people should be uh, accountable for their own actions and, and allowed to make choices? I mean, um, you can in any other area. So I, I again will throw out another idea. I, I propose that 99.9% uh, .9 of these credentials that uh, limit people from entering any field of business are not designed to actually um, keep the public safe or free from harm, but are designed to prevent competition. Is that? I think that's uh, very accurate. Um, you know, there was a good uh, New York Times article about how it actually um, so harms a lot the of the New them. York Times. So let me see your business card. Are you, are you selling ad copy? They, they just started me? paying me. Oh, to that's say it all right. Few minutes. Yeah. Um, no, they had a good article about how uh, it's uh, devastating to the economy because it prevents upward mobility. And when you know economic changes occur, you need to change professions. It makes it even harder for lower mm. income people to do that. But you know, you know, picking backing off your, your initial point, yeah, I totally agree. Whether it's uh, private or even if the government wants to get involved, you can have some sort of seal of approval that says this person, according to us, our organization is good at being a doctor, dentist, whatever. But you're not preventing them from mm -hmm. from doing that. So if the H A A H A that you may um, um, suggest, American Healers is so I uh, like it. Uh, you, I, I you like can it call, well. You can say aha. See how that works? Yeah. <laughs> Or, uh, or the AMA, if, if no one's willing to give you their stamp of approval, you can still go out and you can still say, I'm a doctor. They, they don't say I am, no, no organization says I am, but I'm a doctor. And if someone's willing to pay that person, they can. But if they want, they can look up the website of AHA, AMA, or some other entity and say, well, they've given them approval. I trust this organization, so I'll, I'll give that person my business. And I, I think that would work very effectively and you would prevent these monopolies from occurring that really just prevent access to quality services for people that otherwise can afford it or, or through other circumstances are just unable to get those services as a result of licensing. And I would I would throw another kind of another log on this fire here. There's a, there's a, I don't know if I'm allowed to, I guess consumer reports, I think it's a .org. So when, I, when I'm getting ready to buy a new product, uh, you know, an automobile, an appliance, a set of headphones, whatever, I 
have this $20 a year membership that I go on Consumer Reports and I look at their ratings. And, and the reason people join Consumer Reports is that they believe that those ratings are objective. And the minute if that organization decided to sway their reports in some way, then people would look somewhere else. And I think that kind of commercial, uh, market-driven, independent resource that judges things would work to decide whether or not a hospital is a good hospital or a dentist is a good dentist or anything. Some, yeah, I would agree. Some combination of the independent reviewer, the consumer reports, so you know that they're unbiased. And then you take your Yelp or your Amazon style reviews where you're getting uh, the feedback. Those can be biased to an extent because you, are the reviews real, fake, mm -hmm. but once you get to a, a sufficient number, you get more confidence there also. So some combination of the two uh, provide you with a better rating mm -hmm. than you have Currently. Well, and even, even with the Yelp market forces apply, if, if people follow Yelp guidelines and discover that, you know, the there's cockroaches in the restaurant, the food's undercooked, it's overpriced, the service is surly, they go, bad restaurant, first time, you know. Second time they do it, they're thinking, bad Yelp, and they'll go somewhere else, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we've solved th a third of the world's problems in the last six minutes. <laughs> Good job, guys. Go ahead. Uh, picking up on your consumer reports uh, point, you know, I, um, I, I think it's part of the difference between uh, libertarians, maybe um, liberals or Democrats. You know, I saw a consumer reports are, um, study that claimed that rice had an alarming amount of arsenic everywhere in the country, especially Texas, except for Oregon, Washington, California. And of those three, California was the best. So I started buying California Cal rice. rice. Right. But I don't want the government to say you can't buy Texas rice. I just am happy that I, as a consumer, was able to use this organization that I trust to review things and read their study and say, you know what, I'm going to start making my purchases for California rice until those other states get their stuff together. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you know, a little arsenic is good for you. It's used medicinally. It's a lot of arsenic that you have a problem with. Sure. Well, I think we covered that ground a little bit. Now, um, give Brett a chance here. Pre crime in Georgia prosecuting or persecuting alleged intent. Um. Sure, well, I believe this was a story where uh, a uh, police officer went out uh, soliciting a, a prostitute and, mm -hmm. uh, and then just arrested her, right? I think you saw the story, yes. uh, Gerald. Um, and I guess my argument, if we're going bigger picture with this, I said, well, why don't we just make prostitution legal and regulate mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Singapore a few years ago, actually took my wife to the uh, four floors of horrors so we could see that in uh, action. And wait, let me write that down. No, <laughs> yeah. I don't think my wife would go on that trip with yeah. me. We didn't go. Uh, yeah, we wasn't allowed to go inside, but we uh, we checked it out. And um, obviously, Singapore, uh, very you know safe country, and it, it it works well. It's a good setup. You go. And that's where that's where it happens, and it's regulated, and and that's that. I just think cops have better things to do than to chase down, chase down prostitutes just trying to make a go of it in the world's oldest profession. Anyway, well, I, and I have to be careful here because I'm, as it currently stands, prostitution in this country is not a victimless crime because the the people who engage in prostitution, many of them, except for. There are some exceptions, you know, some, some very famous uh, libertarian exceptions, are really uh, kind of at the mercy of their, their Johns. No relation to this John, by the way. And um, you know, there, there used to be an awful lot of pimps out there until uh, the internet allowed people to market their wares. Um, so I think there's less pimps beating uh, prostitute, but since prostitution is legal, if if uh, a prostitute, if someone chose to go into that profession, um, they would have no legal protection to to um, demand fees for their service or demand payment for fees for their service because they were actually committing a crime, and and so they wouldn't have protection. They wouldn't be able to report that they were beaten um, during the act of a crime, because they'd be as guilty, unfortunately, as. Um, and I, I really think if, if uh, prostitution um, was legal, that it would be um, safer for everybody involved. And it would take policing away from what would then be a victimless crime, which I don't think it is in many cases now. I think there's lots of victims. No, I, I agree. And, and to yeah. your point, it's because of the illegality of, like you said, they're they not able to go to the cops when something goes wrong. Um, 
I, I think Nevada is a good example uh, in a few counties that have done it of making a working system that mm -hmm. is regulated and women aren't at the mercy of, of pimps and they're actually able to um, uh, make decisions on their own, not forced into that uh, mm -hmm. lifestyle. But uh, interestingly enough, in California, we've almost had the perfect example of what you're talking about. Uh, if, you, if you recall, we, um, we had the, I want to say several months ago, with the officers in Oakland um, with the underage prostitute that was the daughter of a dispatcher. They uh, basically were giving her tips saying, you know, we're going to raid this area, so don't be a, a prostitute in that area uh, during the next day. And interestingly, you wonder... Restraint of trade, again, they're favoring one provider of service. And I'm, again, not making light of fleas. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about something very serious in a... In a playful manner, but uh, go ahead, finish your... Well, I would say, interestingly, this wasn't just limited to Oakland. Um, several officers in nearby precinct San Francisco as well um, were, were involved with this uh, uh, young girl, and uh, I think four police chiefs had to resign in the course of a month, three or four, so like a month, they would get a new police chief, they find out some conflict, and they'd fire him, and we don't know what the conflict is, because again, they're so protected, mm -hmm. these uh, uh, public employees. But uh, what's most interesting to me is we wouldn't even know about this but for the unique circumstances that led to it becoming public. Basically, uh, she felt unsafe somewhere. I think she was traveling in Mexico, and she called one of these officers, and he wouldn't get back to her. And she was so annoyed that she said, you know, I'm going to tell your superior what's going on unless you, you help me out and get out of that situation. Of course, he didn't respond. She told the superior. He killed himself, and once he killed himself, a bunch of investigation has gone on. The superior killed himself? Uh, or... Excuse me, the uh, officer that um, she was having sex with uh, when... She was a prostitute. He killed himself because his superior had been told about the um, incident with her. And as a result of an officer killing himself, then it got the attention investigation, hit national news, and now we know that uh, terrible thing the officers were doing there. They weren't stopping prostitutes. They weren't helping these women. They were just getting free services with her under the guise of, hey, we're not going to arrest you because you're having sex with us. A little protection racket going on. Yeah, which ironically is what gangs do. Imagine that. Yeah. Gang in uniform, gang out of uniform. So uh, since we're, we're on the, the subject of uh, what could be victimless crimes, and I, I think, uh, Gerald, why don't you talk about tourists being able to buy weed in Vegas, but they can't smoke it anywhere. That seems kind of strange. Yeah, so th this is a good example of just um, over over regulation. You know, we have, uh, I, I understand the proponents of the initiative, they were, hesitant to allow any sort of public use mm -hmm. because they were concerned uh, that that would lead to the initiative failing and then there'd be no legal marijuana at all. But now we have this situation where the government has said, you know what, tourists, uh, most people buying in like Las Vegas, for example, are tourists. You, you can go buy your marijuana, but you can't use it anywhere that's publicly accessible. So you can't use it in your hotel, can't use it um, you know, on the streets. You, you just, basically, you can buy it, but you can't use it. If you use it, you risk a $600 fine. So, so if you're a homeowner, though, if you're a homeowner, you could. But pe a lot of people in Vegas don't live there, and uh, even the people that live in Vegas don't live there actually. But that's, oh, they might not. Yeah, they might not own a home as well. Yeah. But but that's so. We, there are some instances where people have been able to smoke um, in public, but it's through loopholes. So basically, it'll be like a, a private association, like a club. We'll all get together and we'll smoke together, but you can't. It can't be accessible to the public. So if you are a tourist in Las Vegas. Just by you knowing about it and being able to go there, no longer makes it a private club. Mm. So there, you'd have to buy a membership. You have to buy a membership. And again, yeah. if you're buying membership, then it's public accessible. So they're in this oh, dance where oh, okay. there's no real way for these tourists to buy the marijuana, which they're doing legally. No, no mm. one's contest contesting that. Maybe the feds, but then they're unable to actually use this product that they purchased legally. Well, they, you know, they buy it and they can take the selfie of themselves holding a big joint in their hand and send it to their friends, but they just can't smoke it. Exactly. Right? That seems pretty darn strange. How about traveling with it? Are they allowed to get on a, you're not allowed to get on a plane? Well, so that's what's interesting too. Really, you're not supposed to, but uh, there's conflicting um, reports of basically, basically it's up to the TSA agent. Most TSA agents don't seem to care, but if you find one that does, um, I don't want to be risking uh, interstate trafficking of loss. <laughs> yeah, interstate transport of a uh, controlled substance. Yeah, yeah. It's not a good and one. And it's still, uh, I think pot's still classified in the federal government size in, in the same class as like heroin and yeah, schedule morphine one. and all the rest of that. Obviously, whoever's checking this stuff out has never done heroin and 
marijuana because they would notice there's a pretty significant difference. Um, so um, what about other, other, I mean, victimless crimes? And this is the, the, the one that's always brought up, the, the obvious one is, is drug use. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it really victimless if, uh, if I use drugs and, and I overdose and I crash my car? You know? Victimless? No, but I mean, you're not allowed to drink while you're driving either, and we're certainly happy to let someone drink at home. And similarly, if you want to, uh, I, I think I think this is kind of the distinction. You, know, you can maybe make laws about public intoxication, whether mm. it be alcohol or otherwise. Mm. But then, what you do in your own home, whether it's um, use heroin or use cocaine, that we sound it, like a bunch of druggies, don't we? But that's <laughs> what we're, we're just talking about the uh, about the the moral dilemma here of you know protecting society and and kind of free individual will so go ahead well, mean, well let's mean say you know right. yeah. it's not about drug use so much as um, as gary johnson once put it a harm reduction you mm -hmm. know the amount of users in the u.s is uh, in, in, incredible um mm -hmm. uh, portugal for example and they decriminalized all drugs a little more than a decade ago all drugs all drugs yes so and crime probably plummeted to never before seen lows. Well, not only did it go down, but actually usage went down because yeah. they were dealing with uh, major uh, drug usage. And what's interesting now is per capita, more people use cocaine in the United States than marijuana in Portugal. So it, that's, it's, that's totally flipped on, it, on its head. The, the amount of time and effort we put into stopping drugs only made them more prolific, more dangerous, mm -hmm. and it prevents the consumer from actually knowing what they're getting. You know, uh, some people might think they're using heroin, and then something worse is actually put in there. There was an incident a few years ago where um, dozens of people died over the course of a week because I want to say like some sort of tranquilizer was mm -hmm. put in some batch of heroin. Mm -hmm. You don't get that when you buy something at. Um, a store, you know, it has a label, says what's mm -hmm. in it, mm -hmm. and uh, if the manufacturer is doing something wrong, you know that manufacturer, and you can avoid there's that the, manufacturer. There's the, the uh, manufacturing lot number right on the package, just as there would be with any anything else. Yeah, okay. yeah and, and just uh, generally speaking, it goes to the philosophy, uh, philosophy argument as well, that you should be able to, to make bad choices, otherwise you don't really have choices. Hmm? I always like to see these decisions push down as far as possible so if it was a state-by-state uh, -state decision or county-by-county -county decision i think i'd be more comfortable with it certain states if states wanted to allow everything if utah wanted to have nothing that's kind of utah's uh, i'm hearing you just say if utah wanted to allow everything i was wondering if you were talking about a different utah <laughs> sure <laughs> right <laughs> um so that they, they they but again the states make their own choices versus having it shoved down your throat mm. at the uh, federal level. Mm. I mean, obviously, marijuana being illegal at the federal level mm. um, is 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 r ridiculous, being more on par with alcohol. Uh, but uh, in terms of decriminalizing other things, yeah, I'd like to see that down at more of a local level. Well, let's let's talk about another crime, the the crime that's being foisted upon the youth in this country by uh, government monopoly on K through 12 schooling. Uh, Brett, you want to? Thomas Jefferson warned, a poorly educated society will not remain free. And, and I kind of propose on this, and I'm just going to throw this out as a, throw the ignition switch down on the ground to start the fire, that um, there is intent to um, miseducate the youth of this country because then they are more malleable. Do you think it is misfeasance on the part of uh, bad teaching and this government monopoly, or you think it's malfeasance? Is there intent to uh, create an uneducated mass that is easily manipulated by the powers that be, or is it just um, the unions and the monopoly doing a terrible job as they always do? I think it's more, I lean more on the misfeasance side. I don't think they're that smart. Uh, I lean oh. more on the uh, Harry Brown, don't be too worried about the government having a camera in every room because it's, it's probably broke. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's more of a historical uh, thing from the uh, 1920s, 1930s or so, where we're talking about industrial America, and you just get all the kids in the room like cattle, and you and you preach at them. Mm. Yeah, right. Exactly. So uh, not built for uh, 2017, having to think on your feet, having to think originally. Like you guys um, are doing on the show. Well, you're thinking on your seat, but you're thinking. Sure. Right. Well. Right. So in the uh, classroom, not having all these uh, questions thrown. 
uh, left and right and not having to think critically mm -hmm. uh, about things. So I think it's more of a, just a train of habit. But I think the schooling system gets more and more out of date, um, it, more and more than every year. It's just a, such a relic of, of the past. So I think it's the, but as you said, the monopoly hurts because it stifles then innovation. You see a few bizarre schools, of course, down in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, trying to try new things, uh, but you probably don't see you don't see enough of that because of all the, uh, you just don't have a free market mm -hmm. in terms of education. I'm, I'm going to throw in, did you want to throw something in there? Or? Well, I, I agree. I, I think it's mostly incompetence and uh, part of it is we're teaching to the middle and we don't have enough competition, whereas if we in incentivize charter schools more, we might get schools that gear towards actual skills rather than saying, well, you're this age, so you're in fourth grade. How I don't about care. a voucher? Would anybody have a problem with a voucher? Yeah. A voucher now, I, I propose this as a thought that that all this regulation is, is supposedly to, to protect and provide an education to those who can't afford to educate themselves. But I, I want to throw this idea out, that the people that are actually hurt the most by this government monopoly are, are poor people, because rich people can send their kids to private school. They don't need a government a voucher to counteract that $8,000 or so that it costs to educate a kid in this, in this, um, in this state especially. Um, they just choose to pay for, you know, there's local, like uh, St. Francis or Jesuit or, or the Waldorf School or any of the rest of those that turn out. Now, there are some public schools that turn out magnificent students. I'm not saying they're all bad, but um, the, the norm is, you know, if you pay for it out of your own pocket and send your kid there, you're going to hold the teachers and the system and everybody there the other students accountable to make sure that your kid gets a great education. And unfortunately, poor people in this country don't have that choice. They don't have the wherewithal. They don't have the ability to uh, put aside, what does that work out to, $700 a month for their, for their child's education. Whereas for a doctor who's pulling down a quarter million dollars a year, that's nothing. You know, it's probably less than payment on their Tesla. So um, I, think, I think the people who are hurt worst by this government monopoly on education in this country are actually the people that the, the liberal, not the classic liberals that we all are, but the current liberal um, focus uh, says they're actually trying to help. And, and over and over again, we see these schools failing, these teachers complacent sitting in the classroom till they retire rich, um, you know, and then it's even a double whammy because now you've got the doctor and he's out of the game. He doesn't care about that school system because he's off. He's got his own thing. He's got his, pri his private school and they're out. So now you're left with uh, maybe a, a, an engaged parent family you would want mm -hmm. there and they're off doing their own thing and they're fine. But everyone else is left. You got to keep the good in with the not so good. And on that note, we're going to wrap up the show. Thank you very much for watching Libertarian Counterpoint this evening. You can see us at uh, 8 o'clock on Thursday night on um, Access. I think it's Channel 17 here in Sacramento. You can watch this, I think, at 3 a.m. on Saturday. That's my favorite, very favorite time to watch the show with my eyes closed. You can see us on YouTube about three weeks after this show is uh, done airing. Thank you once again.